right, we're going to give the guys in the back. Oh, I can hear myself. Yes, it's working now. That's awesome. All right. Give me a second here. There we go. So it's been my pleasure over the last nearly three years. I think, you know, July 1st will technically be on our, on our church-wide um, break that we tend to do annually. And so um, normally, you know, between uh, July 1st and the end of July, you know, it's good to have that little break. But it's good to remember to take a minute to just think about where we were three years ago. Um, we had just moved the youth into the youth building, and um, you had hired a, a brand new youth pastor with um, a, a baby just weeks away from coming, and, and now Lorelai here, she'll be turning three in just about a, a month or two, and it's just been a fantastic ride so far. And for these graduates who are, who are coming through, I mean, this was, a lot of these, this was the group that, that I had, this was the group that we started with, this is where Jonesville Baptist was with the youth program. And we didn't really know what was going to happen with it, necessarily. We knew that um, I was bringing some, some music, you know, to the table, and we really weren't sure if it was going to stick. You know, we hoped that it would. There would be a good ministry opportunity with our teenagers, and it turned into um, what you see today. Our music program has been developed, and it's, I can't take any of the credit for it. I can say that God used me. I can say that God used Katrina in that way, but... The way that God just brings things together is miraculous. We didn't get a chance to honor all of our graduates this morning. We have two that are missing. Uh, Colton Myers, who's graduating from Lofton High School, and Jensie Todd, who is not here this morning, who's graduating from PK Young. So um, hope you're watching. Hope you get to see this, but we love you. Congratulations. Um, but 11 graduates, that's a huge part of our program, but in the end, in the last several months, our youth group has just continued to grow as we've seen God just bless it over and over again. And our reach into the community is expanding, and we are blessed in that way. So graduates, up to this point in your life, you've been dependent on your families for everything that you needed. They've loved you, they've sheltered you, they've guided you, and for many of you, JBC has been here for much of your life. And we're your family, too, and we're proud of what it is that you've accomplished and what you are going to accomplish. But don't forget something. This is only the beginning of the rest of your life. Many of the most important decisions that you will make in the next two to three years will shape the rest of your life. It will set you on a path that once you get started, it will take probably an act of God to move away from. And you have to decide who it is that you are going to be. So no pressure. So how can you set yourself up to make good decisions? This morning we're going to uncover some basic biblical principles to give you a standard to follow as you move forward in life. And I'm grateful to say that this year, every one of our graduates has committed their life to Jesus. They have made bold public declarations for that. We can give them a hand for that. That's amazing. That's a blessing to have the, a bigger group as we have coming through our program. And they know who is leading their life. And some of you, most of you in the congregation this morning, are far removed from your high school graduation. But the things that we're going to talk about this morning, they don't have an expiration date. They're always useful and they're always necessary to remember and to put into practice for a productive and holy life. So I'm going to talk for a minute about holiness. Holiness means to be set apart, living righteously before God by depending upon the Holy Spirit. If there was a word that I would use to describe the last three years of the youth ministry, it's been this. I've spent many hours teaching in my time as youth pastor, both in church settings, but also if I have invited teenagers into my personal life as much as I possibly could. Showing them, teaching them, living it out in front of them so they know what holiness means, what holiness looks like, the importance of it. And maybe Pastor Corey is rubbing off on me, but I have four points for you this morning. <laughs> Not the typical Baptist three. We've got to give you one more, right? Uh, and so they all concern your personal holiness. 
When I was a kid, it was just something that was stressed over and over and over again. Uh, Not that it's not stressed in Baptist churches, but I grew up in the Nazarene church, and it's part of the holiness movement. And it seemed like that was just always pushed, stressing personal holiness being so important. And so these points, they can, should be used regularly as a spiritual checkup so that you can evaluate your own focus and help each other remain focused also, focus on Jesus and living in a way that pleases him. So here's the first one. Your integrity defines who you are. Let's read Matthew 5, 21 and 22. It says, You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, Do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment, and whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. And whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hellfire. And let's read Matthew 6, 1 through 4 also. It says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you give to the poor... Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. These two statements at first seem like they might be about two different things, but really they're all about the same thing. God sees farther inside you than you can see inside you. God sees farther inside you than the people around you can see. He knows what the truth is. We've been studying the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew very closely in the last few weeks in youth group. And as these passages show us, God knows us down to the thoughts that we never reveal to other people. And why we do things matters just as much as the things that we are doing. He knows the desires of our hearts and how rebellious we really are. And therefore, our journey towards holy living must begin on the inside Surrendering every thought and making it captive to the Holy Spirit. A point that I like to make in youth group is that sometimes you can get scholarships for doing community service. And that's a pretty good thing that we are able to do that. But I like to make the point that if you're just doing community service, say going to the soup kitchen and helping the homeless, just to get your scholarship. Is that honoring the Lord? I would say probably not. Because once that scholarship opportunity is over, and you've got your benefit, are you going to stick around? Are you going to keep helping? Are you going to keep serving? Or did you just stay long enough that it benefited you? See, we don't practice our righteousness in front of others to be seen. We practice righteousness and holy living Because it honors the Lord, whether we get recognition or benefits or not. The greatest definition of integrity that I ever heard was this. Integrity is when you choose to do what's right, even when no one cares. Some people like to say, even when you're not seen. But anymore, I think the caring part is right. Because there are plenty of people who just don't care whether you do right or wrong. They just rather you live your life and they live their life and nobody gets hurt. And that's not what the Bible teaches. So here's the best modern example to my thinking about how you can evaluate how much integrity a person has. I did not come up with this. Matt Walsh on the Daily Wire. If you listen to Matt Walsh, he's great. Okay? It's a simple experiment, really, but it reveals a lot about who you are. So here it is. Ask yourself, are you a person who puts away shopping carts in their proper place after you're done using them? (laughs) Or do you leave them in the parking lot at Hitchcock's or Publix? Here's what that proves, right? I know. Now I'm going to meddle, sure, yeah. Here's what it is, right? There's no legal reason for you to return your shopping cart. No one's going to bust you. No one's going to write you a ticket. No one's going to fine you, take you to jail over that. It's entirely your choice. 
That's why it's the perfect example. Yet the shopping cart does not belong to you. It's on loan to you from the store. So the right thing for you to do is to take care of it. It also causes problems in parking lots by leaving parking spaces filled that should be empty, by rolling down parking lots to hit cars, right? So where are you with that? When you have an opportunity where you could do right or wrong, selfish or selfless, and there's no penalty, what kind of person are you? It doesn't have to be shopping carts, but that principle applies. Do you do what's right because it pleases the Lord? Or do you do what's right as long as it benefits you in some way? Or do you do what's right only when doing wrong carries a consequence you would rather avoid? Who are you? Because your integrity defines who you are. The Father who sees in secret, who knows more about you than you do, wants to see you grow into a person who loves justice and lives a holy life, submitting all the sinful behaviors and desires to be subdued by the Holy Spirit in your life, even down to how you respect something as simple as a shopping cart. Here's my next point. Your friends reflect who you are. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And Ephesians 5.6-10 says, Let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. And therefore do not become their partners. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Testing what is pleasing to the Lord. And many of you here know the artist Toby Mac. And he said, you become like the people you spend the most time with, so choose wisely. My first series at Jonesville Baptist and youth group was all about the things in life that we choose to surround ourselves with. We talked about movies and music and podcasts. And I still see the fruits of those lessons today. The teenagers still come up and talk to me about them. And they've begun to see the importance of thinking critically about the things that we put in front of ourselves. In a day where you can put anything in front of your eyes that you want to. Nothing is off limits today. No person is immune to influence either. What you choose to surround yourself with matters. And everything you consume slowly will change you one way or another. But nowhere is this more true, however, than evaluating the company that we keep. Who are your closest friends? Think about the kind of people they are. They say a lot about who you are right now and who you want to be. Graduates, you've reached a point in your life where you get to decide who you're going to be. You kind of have a chance to reinvent yourself because no one in high school is going to hold anything against you. They don't have influence over you anymore, even though some of them might try. You have more freedom now than you have ever had. And now the world is waiting and watching to see who you choose to become. So take a look at the friends you're trying to keep close and think about what that might mean about yourself. Psalm 1-1 says, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Some of you have expressed that you still don't know who you want to be. And here's a hint. You're making decisions every day about who you're going to be. And this applies to all of us here. Every day you're making decisions moment by moment about who it is that you want to be. You might be sitting here and you're confused about who it is that you are. Maybe you're in some kind of crisis in that way. But you're still making choices moment to moment. And those choices help define who you are, including the people you spend time with. So who you choose to spend time with and who you choose to listen to now will shape who you are tomorrow. Think about this psalm that I just read. The person who chooses to stay away from sinful advice and people who enjoy sinful behavior 
will be happy, which literally translated just means blessed by God. God's favor will be on you when you critically choose who you spend time with. You choose people who are encouraging, you choose mentors in your commitment to following Jesus and you pursue holiness, or you choose people who steer you towards other things. And they don't have to be bad things, they just have to be things that take you away from Jesus. Where you end up five years from now, ten years from now, hinges on the people you choose to keep in your life, the people you choose to listen to. Now, some of you might be thinking, I'm saying you should cut out anyone and everyone in your life who is in some way opposed to your faith. And I'm not saying that at all. What I am suggesting is that the people you spend the most time with do reflect the person that you are. They do reflect the person that you want to be. And if you're thinking to yourself about the kind of people in your life, and there might be some red flags, maybe do something with it. Make some changes. I tell my teens all the time, if you're struggling with sin, don't just confess it, get radical. Make changes. Have some action to go with that. Because true repentance isn't just, okay, I gave it to God, now God, you fix it. He gives us the power, and then we have to go do. That's the point. And yes, if you have to back off relationships, that's tough. Nobody likes that. But if it's for your benefit, if that relationship is poisoning your relationship with the Lord, yeah, you probably need to back off. You have to evaluate where you're at. And Proverbs 16, 28 says, A contrary person spreads conflict, and a gossip separates close friends. So here's here's another hint. Avoid people who are constantly involved in gossip and drama, and don't give them a foothold in your life. Stay away from those who pull you into worthless passions, and that includes TV and entertainment and music and anything else, who pull you into those things that you you know that it's not honoring to the Lord, Because those things will derail your life. Stay close to people who want to invest in your life just because they love you, not because they want something from you. You stick to that, you're going to end up in a good place. And you've got a good family here at JBC, good leaders here who want that for you. My third point, what you worship becomes who you are. And this is kind of an extension of the last one. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When we read the Old Testament, it's easy to find people within its pages worshiping idols. God's command in Exodus 20 So to have no other gods before him makes a lot of sense in that context to us. But we do have our own gods today that we willingly put before the God. When we're more focused on what we want, when we're more focused about what feels good to us than what feels right to us. So you might not have idols carved out of wood in your house that you go and worship. But Jesus' point, Matthew 6 does resonate with our struggles today because materialism is rampant. We want what we want and we want it right now and it's usually at the expense of someone or something else. When we direct our thoughts and behaviors towards holiness, our attitude changes. The way we use money changes. The way we treat people changes. Our view of objects and stuff changes. We're more willing to let God direct it where he wants it, despite what we would rather do with it. And often it looks like hoarding. Hoarding our time, hoarding our resources. And it's not always about money. Check your life. I don't know about you, but if you've got an iPhone, your iPhone has this great thing that once a week it will tell you how long you've been on your phone. My computer, also a Mac, does the same thing. And for many of us, screen time has taken over our existence. I've started this semester substituting at schools in Newberry 
I, I haven't done the elementary school yet. That's building up to that one. But I've done the middle school and I've done the high school and I did an experiment with the kids. I asked them, so what's your screen time like on your phone for the ones that have phones? And I'll have you know that in the middle school, the lowest number I found was eight hours a day. The highest number I found was 17 hours a day. At the high school, the numbers were not that different. This is where our kids spend their time. It, when I was growing up, it always used to be that the, the pastor would make the point that the church only had the kids for 52 days out of the year. And that the parents are responsible for all the other 300 some odd days. Yet today, who are our kids getting their opinions and information from? Not so much the schools. Their phones have way more influence. The internet has way more influence. And when I say that you can put anything in front of your eyes, I have met students who found snuff films on the internet and were asking me about them. Not hard to find. So you've got to decide... What's ruling your existence? What's got a hold on you? It might not be screen time or video games or TV, which some kids were eager to point out to me that they spend a lot of time on, as well as all that screen time. But we Christians have to check to see what takes control of our lives. Addiction and idolatry comes in various shapes and sizes. So whether it be your devices or something else that dominates your time and your thoughts, if it's coming between you and actively living for God, then it has to go. And I think that's probably the greatest way to think about what it is that your life is about, is where do you spend your time? Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Paul tells us that we must present our bodies as a living sacrifice, as our true worship. We have to set aside ourselves completely, offering every part of ourselves to God. And we let him decide which parts of us get to stay, and in what form. Your life is like a house with many rooms, each filled with your roles and your desires in life. And when we invite Jesus into our life to be our King and Savior, sometimes we lock the door to a couple rooms. We say, you can have most of me, Jesus, but not all of me. I got to keep this reserved for myself. I'm not sure what you might do with it. <laughs> We're scared to let go. And to be sure, God does want to rearrange every part of who you are and every relationship in your life. He needs all of it. If you're calling him Savior, you're calling him Lord. That's what that means. And when we totally lay ourselves down, we give God the master key to our life. And the total abandonment of ourselves to the Lord is what is holy and pleasing to God. It's what he wants. In this act, he renews us. And in this act, he shapes our minds and he points us to the purposes that he designed us for. And we each have this unique purpose in the world. In Philippians, Paul shows us the sorts of things that God would have us enjoy, the things that please him. Philippians 4, 8 through 9 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. When you see, can you roll it back to that verse 8? You want to know if what you're putting into your life is pleasing to the Lord? Use this. Netflix, Disney Plus, any of the music apps that you got. 
For me, it's podcasts that you listen to. I love listening to podcasts. Do they fit this? Because these are the things that God requires. These are the kinds of things that God says is pleasing. And no, it doesn't have to be that you only listen to preaching and that you only listen to Christian music. But it does have to fit the standard. And if it doesn't, you need to check yourself. Check and see who your Lord is. Is it currently Jesus, or are you worshiping yourself? Are you making yourself Lord and making your own decisions, and you've locked him out of that room? It does matter, and it matters a lot. In our world every day, there are less things to experience and enjoy that are defined by those words. So you have to make the decision to follow God into a life more abundantly or live for yourself by following the crowd off the cliff. Others will avoid you, they will shun you, and they will mock you. That's probably the favorite right now. The longer and more sincerely that you take this Christian life seriously, they'll think you're crazy. They think you're giving up things that you ought not give up for the sake of a Jesus that they don't believe in. But it makes a world of difference. Which brings me to my last point. And this is the point that I'd like you to stand up as we read this scripture. Because this is the scripture for this morning I want us to focus on. James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4. It says, You know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for your word that doesn't fail us. Thank you for your graduates. Pray for their decisions as they move forward in life. Help us as a church to be role models for them, to make changes where necessary, and to lead them into the future and to help them as friends and mentors. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The testing of your faith produces endurance. And endurance, when it has its full effect, you'll be mature and lacking nothing. And verses 12 through 17 also says, Blessed is the one who endures the trials, because when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil, and he does not tempt anyone but each person is tempted when he's drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. The Bible has a lot to say about living in stress. And that's my point. How you handle stress, handle the stress, reveals who you are. Not that there won't be stress, not that there won't be suffering, there will be. Kind of like in Star Wars where Yoda says, you will be right? There will be stress. There's going to be those scary moments. They're coming. Trusting in Jesus doesn't mean that they're not coming. In fact, you're probably going to get more of it. And we have to be okay with that as believers of Jesus. But we know that God gives us what we need. He equips us for every circumstances when we're trusting in him. And in the Bible, and what we just read in James, it says that our trials, our suffering, our stressors are good things. Because they squeeze us. And when we get squeezed, what is inside of you comes out. And you'll see what you're really made of. God already knows us what's, what is going to come out. But in order to change us, we often have to be convinced and brought to the point of breaking sometimes in order to be willing to make the changes inside to be holier. When we go through those periods, we say on the mountaintop, and everything seems to be going good, you might get tempted to think, I'm there. I made it. I don't know how I did, but I'm sanctified totally. I'm good. That's one of the weird doctrines about the church that I grew up in. They believe that you can do that while you're still alive. I didn't know that till later. I had already left the church, but they do. It's called entire sanctification. It's not biblical. But God is continually bringing us along this process of becoming holier, 
becoming righteous like Jesus. And when we get to heaven, that's the finish line. And every stressor, every circumstance of suffering, every hard time is a blessing from God because it helps us in that process of growth. As Christians, when we learn to see life that way, it's not that you don't not get sad anymore. Obviously, you do. But you see that there's a purpose in it. There's a reason for it. So instead of moaning and complaining and hating our difficult lives, James, in chapter 1, encourages us to remember that God is sovereign. And that he means it for good. And he's working things out for good for those who love him. He's using it to change us into people that look more like him. And we will be able to handle more difficult things in the future because we're learning how to live holier each time we encounter the next problem. It's kind of like learning how to ride a bike. You start with the trike, then you get a bike with training wheels, and training wheels come off, and once the wheels come off, someone's holding the seat to keep you steady for a bit until you finally get it. And even then, you'll probably fall down a few times before you're able to do it on your own. My dad was good to me. He did that last part with me in the grass so that I wouldn't get hurt. Good dad. He loved me. It was hard to pedal, but the ground was soft. Not for my brother. Garrett felt the asphalt a lot. He had more skin knees than I can think about. And we still tease dad about Garrett's skin to knees. Dad just let Garrett go on the road. I'm not even sure how long he even held on. <laughs> And Garrett was proud of his bruises, but man, I didn't get those. I was baby. Life is going to skin our knees. But like my dad, God's there to comfort you. Every circumstance is going to build on the last one, teaching you what you need to know for the next one. He's going to be there to comfort you, to bandage you, and get you right back on that bike again. We have the option to respond in joyful obedience or in total rebellion. Garrett was tough. He's still tough. He got back on that bike and he kept trying until he got it. We worship the God of the universe. He's the creator, king of everything, and he loves you specifically. You are not an accident. You are not a mistake. The things that happen in your life have a purpose. And when the storms of stress roll in, we can face them confidently and learn how to navigate life in a way that honors the Lord. We can be like Paul, who was content, whether he had barely anything to his name or he had a lot. God alone was all he needed. And Philippians 4, 12 and 13 says, I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Some people like to take this verse and twist it. I see it in locker rooms a lot. It's not really what this verse is about. It's about when the hard times come. Paul can handle it, not because he's some superhuman dude, but because God is with him, and God provides for him. So, graduates, congratulations on your next steps in life. It's been my pleasure watching you grow into the men and women that you are today, whether I have known you for weeks or years. And my prayer is that you think about these things and you allow God to shape you into the men and women you were designed to be. One more time. Here's what we got this morning. Your integrity defines who you are. Your friends reflect who you are. What you worship becomes who you are. And how you handle stress reveals who you are. Eli coming to Saving Faith in the last two weeks has been pretty awesome. It's been a prayer of ours for quite a while that he would hear the gospel and he would receive it. He'd be baptized in that way. And as our band comes up, if there's anyone here who hasn't taken that step that the little boy this morning did and trusted Jesus with their life, you need to do that. There's no reason to wait. It doesn't make sense to wait. I encourage you to go ahead and take that step. We're not promised tomorrow. And I don't say that to scare you. I say it because it's true. 
And at JBC, we love you. We want to see you grow. We want to see you mature. If you want to be a church member and you haven't taken that step yet, but you've been here a little bit, I encourage you, you can do that too. But this morning as a family, um, as they get ready, let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for being the wonderful, loving God that you are. As we open up for this time of invitation, I pray that you would be with uh, the prayers that are being sent up. I pray that our worship this morning is honoring to you and that every day we would be just resubmitting our lives to you in the pursuit of holiness and because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.